the message is it depends a lot on the hearer. It's not always just the one that's speaking. If you'll draw this morning, if you'll open the bucket and cut the faucet wide open, the Holy Spirit will flow. Amen? Amen. Expect big things this morning. Not just, don't expect just usual. Now, I'm a word kind of guy. You know, the Lord operates through every individual that he calls to minister in whatever way, different ways. I'm just a stickler for the word of God. I love the word of God. But I like the movement of the Holy Ghost also. Amen? So if the Holy Spirit moves, you move. Amen? Let God be God. But I want to talk to you today. This, I guess it may be more about healing because this is more of the scriptures that I have here today, but um, it can work for anything. We're going to talk about, I talk a lot about faith because that's how God operates. That's, that's how he works. I think I put online at uh, Watch Us This Morning, I was going to be ministering on uh, who's in control of your life. Are you in control or is God in control? Most, most people say, well, just let go and let God. Just, I just give it to the Lord. Well, he give it to you. There's many scriptures we could go into where the Lord, he, he gave the earth to man. He gives us our own free will. He can't do above what we want him to do or what we're willing to believe him for. Jesus went into his own hometown and they said, who is this fellow? Who does he think he is? Isn't that, uh, isn't that Mary and Joseph's little, little boy? Isn't, isn't his uh, sisters and brothers running around here? Who does he think he is? Oh, he was somebody. They just missed it. And it said he marveled at their unbelief. It said in his own hometown, he could there. didn't say he wouldn't. He said he couldn't do any mighty works there. He said he just laid his hands on a few sick people. A few. Don't you know he, he saw people that he grew up watching and after the Holy Spirit came on him and anointed him and called him into the ministry that... Uh, Oh, don't you know, he, he thought about sister so-and-so, a brother so-and-so. He just wanted to fix it, but, but he couldn't. God was in him, and he couldn't. He couldn't. But I tell you what, he give us something. He give us the word. Amen. God just wants us healed. He wants us blessed. Third John and 2 says, Beloved, this is the, the apostle was the disciple. The apostle, he... He was close to Jesus. He was the one that said he was leaning on Jesus' breast. Two grown men. And he was, wasn't anything funny going on there. He loved the Lord. He knew the Lord loved him. And uh, he said, Beloved, I, Holy Spirit speaking through him, he said, I wish above all things that you'd prosper in this earth and be in health. I want you to be healthy as your soul prospers. Your soul has to prosper. Your spirit, man, you have to prosper. You have to renew your mind. And I better get to it because I have a long way to go. But um, I have these notes. I want to just try to keep myself on track. We're going to 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. I'm going to read it out of the New Living Testament. I don't know why I've done that. Um, I don't know if I meant to print it that way or not, but we'll read it that way. It said in... Let's pray over the word. I know it's blessed, but Father, we thank you for your holy written word. We know it's blessed already. We thank you for breathing on it. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise, Lord. Any good thing that's done here today, it's because of you. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. But he said, and this is the Apostle John. He said, and, and we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. Yeah, I know why I put it there now. And we go into another translation of it too. He said, we're confident that God hears us whenever we ask anything that pleases him. It doesn't mean he doesn't hear it at all, but I don't know too much about the law. But I know you can't just... Uh, run up before the judge and, and start running your mouth and, and want to sue somebody or, or bring somebody to court. First, you have to go through the right authorities and see if you have enough evidence to bring a case before the judge, before he will even hear you. 
We have to go in faith to Almighty God. It's through grace. I mean, we, He's called the throne of grace. But we still have to approach God in faith and we have to go according to the, I hate to call it the law because I don't want you to get the misunderstanding we're talking about. We're not talking about the Ten Commandments. We're talking about the blessings, the promises of God. When God says something, that's the way it is and it's not going to change. He set the whole universe in order and it keeps it in order by the power of His Word, by the authority of His Word. When He spoke it, and then it became a law. They can go back and tell you millions of years ago, so they think anyway, but they're pretty good. They know that scientists are smart. They can tell you where this planet was or certain planets were and what part of the orbit they were in thousands of years ago because of God's laws. His Word is like a law. Whatever He says, it's a promise. It doesn't change. So he said, we have to, whenever we ask anything, that's the way New Living Tet puts it, that pleases him. Verse 15, and since we know, we don't have to wonder, we know he hears us when we make our request, we also know. We don't wonder, we know that he will give us what we ask for. Why? Because we ask it according to his will. If you work for a company and you have a benefits package, you could work for that company for 20 years and, and never use the ability to take a vacation and get paid for it. Uh, need to go to the hospital and, and you go in and pay the bill out of your pocket and not realize you had health insurance all those years. But if you get your benefits package, any company you go to work for, any company I've ever went to work for that had a benefits package, you go to what is it, human resources and they indoctrinate you if you will and then they give you a, a booklet it says this is our benefits package and these are the laws that govern our company this is the way we want you to handle business for us when you're out representing our company you represent it along these lines we give you guidelines to operate by and this is what we'll do for you and you know you look and you say hey I get uh, I get three weeks of vacation that's right out of the get go are you going to use them? If you go add, if you go, if you don't have any benefits, and you go in there and you say, "Look, I, I want to, I, I need about three weeks off paid," and you don't have any vacation, or, or is anybody going to hear you? They're going to hear you, but you're not going to get very far. This is what he's talking about. Let's read it in the. Uh, <clears throat> well, I have. Three versions here, didn't I? I didn't realize that. Let's look at the God's Word. I think that's what I give Justin. I don't think I give you the New Living Testament, did I? I'm sorry. God's Word says we are confident that God listens to us if we ask for anything that has his, already has His approval. We know that he, he listens to our requests, so we know that we already have what we ask Him for. Now, here's the weast. Translation. A lot of you probably never heard of that, but the Weiss translation says, verse 14, uh, and this is the assurance which we are having towards Him, that if we keep on asking anything for ourselves, which is according, which is according to His will. Now he really breaks down the Greek and the Hebrew, well, mainly the Greek. He breaks it down and puts it in the order that they have it in most of the time which is according to his will, he said, then he'll hear us. And if we know with an, I like this, an absolute knowledge that he hears us, whatever we are asking for ourselves or for anyone else, we know with an absolute knowledge that we have the things which we have asked him for. How many times over the years before I started learning after 14 years, matter of fact, that I come and I'd, I'd ask the Lord for healing. Somebody prayed, lay hands on me. The, healing, the evangelist came through and man, I couldn't wait to get in the line. I need somebody to lay hands on me. And that's okay. That's good. God works that way. But I was at the point he didn't, I wasn't getting, listen, I don't know, I wasn't getting it that way. And I kept thinking, well, Lord, I'm asking you to heal me. And I wasn't receiving it. I thought it was something God God was going to have to get up from his throne 
and manifest something he was going to have to do new. You know, this is something he's going to have to do now. I didn't know. I didn't know he had already provided it. What Jesus already paid for on the cross with his life, with his blood, with the stripes that he bore, many scriptures confirm that. But I didn't, I didn't understand that. I used to hear Brother Billy, he'd shake and he'd get on the anointing. He'd say, by his stripes I am healed. And so I'd do it too. But it didn't work like it did for him. I didn't own it like he did. I didn't understand what he did. But I did come to understand it. If we ask anything according to his will, we know we have it right now. Jesus said in Mark 11, 23, 24, he said, Therefore I say unto you, what things ever you desire when you pray, when you pray, you believe right then that you have received it. You may, it may not be manifest to you, but you know what? Especially if it's with, about healing, God's not holding it back. He said, be it done unto you according to your faith. Whenever you ask for healing, and I'm not talking to any certain anybody, I'm talking to myself too. I've got something I'm dealing with too. It's not, God's not holding back. Lord, why couldn't we cast that devil out? He said, because of your unbelief. We let none, his unbelief is like one horse pulling one way and, and faith is pulling the other way. They play in tug of war. We have to wash ourselves with the, with the water. I need to. I need to get there. I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, so we ask according to his will. And I thought because I didn't feel or see the manifestation right then, and sometimes with money. I thought because I didn't see it right then. Well, if you're dealing with money, uh, you're dealing with other people. God has to work and deal with other people. And he may have something he needs you to do. You know, uh, Jesus said, give, and it'll be given back to you. So, and then you reap. Anyway, um, I read all that, didn't I, in the Weiss translation? Yeah, I did. Okay, Romans chapter 12. I know these are basic. I know we've looked at these. Why you keep going over? When we get it right and I see it working in everybody's life, then maybe the Lord will let me move on. We need to operate in it. We need to operate in it. What is it that's impossible to God? Nothing outside of himself. But he said it's impossible to please him without faith. Why? Because he can't do what he is ready, willing, and able to do because we're not able to receive it. It takes faith. What's faith? Faith, Romans uh, 10 and 17 said, faith comes from one place by hearing and hearing with a spiritual ear, the word of God, till we get the revelation and we see it. We get it in our heart and it gets so big, it busts out of our mouth and then we start acting on what we said. That's faith. That's faith that produces results. Romans 12 and 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, Paul is saying, that you present your bodies, he's saying, you present your life on the altar. He doesn't need us to hang on the cross. He doesn't need us to suffer. And he said sometimes we would be persecuted. We would suffer. But he doesn't need us to do what Jesus done. Now, yes, if you get control of your flesh, <clears throat> your flesh is going to feel like it's suffering sometimes until it starts reaping the benefits. But he said, present your bodies, your life, a living sacrifice. God doesn't need a, somebody else to go to the cross and die. We can't, we can't publish the gospel then. We've gone to the other side. He needs somebody that's living that <clears throat> we would give our life to him and say, here, Lord, you gave your life, your body for me. Now I'm going to give you my body so you can live through me. You died and went to heaven, but you said you'd come back in the form of the Holy Spirit. You'd be in us. Now live your life through me. I believe I heard Dwayne say something this morning about uh, if you seek to save your life or one of those scriptures, you'll lose it. But if you'll lose your life or give up your life and your ambitions and your dreams 
from me in the gospel, he said, you'll find yourself. You'll find the joy of the Lord that is your strength. It, it won't cost too much. It won't be too much labor. It won't be, nothing will be too intense for you because it'll be motivated and driven out of love for the Lord. Becoming one with him. I mean, look, <clears throat> I was living at home. I was 20 years old. I was born again. I could sleep in if I wanted to, which I, I never did at that point. My clothes were washed every day. There was food on the table. I had a mom and daddy that loved me. And I walked off and left all that security. <laughs> Nothing, no price was too great. I didn't care if I had to live in a pup tent. And I still wouldn't care today, as long as she's there. So what is it that we drag for Jesus? I'm trying to get on something else, but we just here just a second. He said, you present your bodies a holy, acceptable, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is, he said, this is just your reasonable service. Here's the scripture I really want to get to with where we're at today. Be not conformed to this world. Don't think like you used to. Some people are raised up in a household of faith. I remember um, Jeremy Pearson, which is Kenneth Copeland's grandson. And uh, he said, you know, he said, boy, you didn't want to tell mom and dad, look, I'm, I don't feel good today. I, I don't want to go to school. He said, because they'd say, all right, let's get your scriptures out. And he said, buddy, you know, he said, we were, they always talked about us being the household of faith. And he said, while he was growing up, he said, I thought that we were that household, he said, I thought we were the household of faith. Yeah. He was raised up believing that stuff. His, his brain was already washed from carnal, natural thinking that I'm just a, I'm only human. I'm just a, what, a man or a woman, depends on who's singing it. No, we're not. We are a spirit. We have a soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions, and we live in a body which gives us trouble. And it all depends on how we're trained growing up. The schools that we go to, what the teachers tell us. Can you say amen to that? If you go to some of these other countries, <clears throat> they hate America. Some of them hate Israel. Some of them hate, and some of those countries, especially over there where Israel's at in the east, they teach them growing up to hate these people. And they grow up, they don't know why. They don't know why they hate them. They've just been taught that way. Well, we need to be raised up and we need to be raising up children to be taught who God is, what they, who they are in Him, and what they have in Him, how much God loves them. He said that you be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. We know that's metamorphosis. Is that the right word? A caterpillar turning into a butterfly. It's the same thing he's talking about with us. When we're born again, you may be born again into the kingdom of heaven. Your spirit is born again, but you have to be trained up. You can go all your life, all your Born again life and never know what belongs to you. You know, a lot of the people that come into America from other countries legally, they have to, don't they have to be here? It used to be seven years or something like that. And, and then they have to go through some schooling and they have to learn. Um, I don't even know all the things they have to learn. Our constitution and all this, they have to learn that stuff. A lot of them know more about what rights they have in America than we do. Well, we're born into the kingdom of heaven and we have a manual. It's called the Holy Bible. And it has to be rightly divided. There's an Old Covenant and a New Covenant. It's called Old Testament, New Testament. A will and testament. That's why we, we take communion. It says, he, do this in remembrance of my death. The will can't go into effect until the person that makes the will dies. You know, you can make a will and have it recorded at the courthouse, but nobody can go make a claim. 
Well, I'm giving you the house. Well, nobody can go take your house from you while you're still living. But once you die. But thank God Jesus rose again, and now he's the mediator of his own new covenant. We have a covenant with the blessings that belong to us. We're redeemed from the curse of the law. That includes any form of sickness, any form. In the book of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, <clears throat> somewhere, I think it's over around verse 30-something, he's listing all these diseases. I mean, he talks about you losing your house, your lands, your family, your children, your wife, all kind of stuff. And he claims, all, he mentions all kind of diseases. And he said, if there be any other disease that's not mentioned here, hadn't been given a name yet, it's included also. Any new name they come up with, any new disease, it's under the curse. And we've been redeemed from the curse. We don't deny what happens in our body. As I've said many times, you don't look in the mirror and there's a big old gorder on. People nowadays don't have gorders like they used to. I guess it was a, some kind of vitamin deficiency or getting too much of one vitamin or something. I don't know. But, you know, they used to, they'd, have, they'd get gorders on them a lot. You don't look in the mirror and see a big gourd and say, and somebody say, man, what's, oh, what are you talking about? Oh, I don't have that. No, that's denying a fact. I'm not saying that. You don't deny that something's there. You deny the right to be there. You speak directly to it. That's almost another message. But you take authority and say, I'm redeemed from this. You don't have a right to be here. Get out. And you do it. How long do I have to do that? Until you win. Until you win. You'll never get beyond this point. You have a flesh as long as you live in this earth. And it's going to fight you. The enemy's going to work through your flesh as long as you're living in this body, in this world. I mean, even Smith's Wigglesworth, who raised the dead numerous times, he had problems in his own body. But yet he was able to go out and do miracles. He was a rough scoundrel. I heard somebody talking about him the other day, and I seemed like I read it, but I, I don't remember. It's been so many years ago. Talking about he kicked a baby off of the platform one time. But when the baby landed out there, they caught him or something, he was healed. <clears throat> I mean, he done some rough stuff. I don't want to be like that, but uh, <laughs> hey, he got the job done, though, didn't he? He was tough, buddy. Hit a woman in the stomach one time. Well, whop, and hit her in the stomach. And she threw up a cancer. <clears throat> She's healed. Man, he done some, some awful things, really. But he said, be conformed. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I like this. He said that you may prove. What is that good? All of them are, are good. Each one of them is good, but he's bringing us to a point that that which is good, that which is acceptable, and that which is God's perfect will. Living in divine health, divine provision, full of joy. Let's think, Jesus knew who he was. <clears throat> That's just been on my heart the last so many weeks that said, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Yes, despising the shame, but now he sat down at the right hand of the Father. It wasn't just that he was going to sit back down at the right hand of the Father, but now I guess that's part of it, but he saw, I'm going to give them the ability to stand up against the enemy, the devil, Satan, Lucifer. Just think, he was a beautiful creation of God at one time. How in the world could you fall from God's presence? Oh, my goodness. But anyway, we're to renew our mind to the ways of the laws that govern the kingdom of heaven. God's ways are totally different than natural ways. God is a spirit. God is a spirit. He lives in a spiritual kingdom and so do we, but we're tied to this natural body, so we seem to be more aware. I mean, I guess it's easier to be more aware of your natural presence than it is the real you. 
the body without the spirit, uh, we put them in caskets and some people, um, what do you call it? Um, cremate. But the spirit's still alive somewhere. Your spirit's going, you are going to spend eternity somewhere. He said, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And most of the time I hear people, they're talking about the Holy Spirit. And that's true. But you, the recreated, born again, spirit man, you, you, you made in God's image. You just, you look just like him on the inside. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Greater are you that's on the inside of the, the spirit man that, that's on the inside of this body than the natural man on the outside. And yes, we're one with the Holy Spirit. So we have to look inside and say, wait a minute. Am I going to live from who I am in the natural? Or am I going to live from who I am who God has made me to be the spirit man, recreated spirit man. I'm just as righteous as God is because he made me righteous. Did he do a sloppy job? We look in the mirror and we look at our weaknesses and faults in the flesh. We don't think much of ourselves. But God, when he even chose David, he told Samuel, these are not the ones that came before David. David was the runt. He was the last one. And he said, I don't, Samuel, I don't look on men like you do. I look on his heart. I look on the heart of a man. God looks at our spirit. When he made us new, he made us brand new. Oh, I just want to stop and get off on so many places. I need to move on. Matthew 16 and 19. <clears throat> Let me back up to verse 13. I'm not going to read it, but Jesus asked Peter, he said, who... He said, who do they say that I, the Son of Man, am? <clears throat> who do they say I am? And they said, you know, some say the prophets, some say this, that, and the other. He said, <clears throat> excuse me, he said, who do you say I am? I mean, is he provider today? Is he healer today? Is he your joy? See, all that comes, it comes in an all-inclusive package. If you'll read Galatians 5, I think it's 22. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, kindness, temperance, faith. That come with a package. That's God's nature. That's who you are. But Jesus said, who do you say I am? Who do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? And Peter had a revelation. All these scholars, the Pharisees, they were looking at the Son of God, and they were looking at God through those eyeballs. And they said, he's just another man. But Peter didn't know all those scriptures. But his heart was right. God revealed it to him and he said, you are the son of God. And he said, Peter, you are blessed because man's wisdom and knowledge, flesh and blood, has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven has revealed it to you. You can't get born again without that revelation. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says, no man can say that Jesus is Christ or the Messiah except by the Holy Ghost. Well, a lot of people can say those words, but they can't say them, they can't believe them in their heart and confess them with their mouth except the Holy Spirit reveal it to them. And Jesus said, this is the first key. This is the first key. This is the key that unlocks the safe or the door. You walk inside this door, you walk inside the, you are born into the kingdom. You get in the kingdom and then you have all the rights of a citizen of a kingdom. We have rights in America. We used to. They're trying to do away with a lot of them now. I won't get over into it. I was going to get into politics a little bit, but I won't. Let's get in back into faith. Um, we have rights. You go to Mexico, you don't have very many rights. The only rights you have there is if they're afraid of the American government coming down and getting on their rear end if they mess with you. But you have rights in America. You have rights in the kingdom of heaven. You have authority over evil spirits. 
You have authority over sickness and disease. You have rights. The kingdom of heaven will work for you and it won't work for people that's not born again. That is a good place to shout, holler, glory to God. It's true. Things will work for you being born again. It's not because God is mean. Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, you can't see the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again. You have to be born into that country, that kingdom, to be able to enter it. You can't get there. You can't get a passport to get there outside of the name of Jesus. He said, you have to be born again to see it, that it's revealed to you. They said, Lord, tell us when the kingdom's coming. He said, it's not coming with observation. He said, the kingdom is on the inside of you. Oh, glory to God, man. So we have to renew our mind. Anyway, he said, you're blessed because that's been revealed to you and you understand it. And then verse 19, I'm going to read it out of the amplified version. I don't know what I give you, Justin. I hope I didn't tell you King James. The amplified version says, Jesus said, and I will give you, this is the first key, who I am, but I will give you the keys, plural, to the kingdom of heaven. And here's the way this needs to read, because this is the way the Greek puts it. Whatever you bind on earth or declare to be improper and unlawful on earth must be what is already bound are improper and unlawful in the kingdom of heaven. What we do, we're getting an agreement with the laws that govern the spiritual kingdom of heaven. It doesn't matter what the laws are here. It doesn't matter that there's a law of gravity that says man cannot walk on water with the size of his feet. Peter walked on it. Jesus walked on it. If God's word says you can then a new, there's a spiritual kingdom law that overrides natural law. Peter said, Lord, if that's you, command me, give me, I want to walk on water. And the way we read, he just said one word, come. And one man out of 12 heard it. Of course, only one man asked, I guess. He said, come. And so Peter stepped down out of the ship wasn't a little John boat. He stepped down out of the ship and the waves were tossing, the winds was blowing, but it didn't matter. He had his eyes on Jesus. And he stepped out on the Word of God. The Word of God, the spiritual Word of God overcame the laws that govern this natural kingdom. Y'all with me? So he said, whatever you bind, declare to be improper and unlawful on earth must be what is already bound in heaven. Whatever you loose or agree with, declare lawful on earth must be what is already loosed or that's lawful in the kingdom of heaven. It's the power of agreement. It's learning how the kingdom operates. Learning the promises of God. It says now that Jesus has gone to the cross, now all the promises of God are yes and amen. Not maybe yes and well, sometimes God says yes, sometimes God said no. Well, he might depending on how we pray. As we start off, if we pray according to his will, what is, how do we know what his will is? It's in his word. And we have to rightly divide the word. If you get in looking the covenant in the Old Testament, you're going to get all mixed up. You're going to get over to the New Testament and it's different. We're living under a new covenant. You find out what the New Testament, what the new covenant says, and that's how we live today. God's not the same God. Is he? He's the same God, but I can't get into all that this morning. There was a purpose for that at that time. The judgment. But now we're living under grace. All these promises. We don't have to earn it. They're a gift. It's what God wants to do. He said he, he desires to give his children the kingdom. I don't know if I, I don't think I give Justin this. Um, Amos 3 and 3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? If, if God's kingdom is 
is there and healing's available, but we say, well, <clears throat> I got prayed for tonight, but uh, nothing happened. And you know what? Nothing happened. Jesus was, uh, the, the Pharisees were there. It said Jesus was teaching. He was teaching them the covenant, the new covenant. He was teaching about the kingdom, and it said, and the, and the power of the Lord was present to heal. But we don't see where any of them got healed. But we see where the man tore the tiling off of the roof and he let himself down or his friends let him down in front of Jesus <clears throat> and it said Jesus saw their faith. And the man took up his bed and walked. Yeah. Why? Because of his faith. Not because of Jesus' faith. The woman that, with the issue of blood said she came behind Jesus. She kept saying to herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. You can say, well, God knew everything. I don't know if he knew that she was there or not. It said she touched the hem of his garment and immediately she was healed. And Jesus knew it. He said, virtue went out of me. He felt it. I felt before. I don't walk on feelings, but I have felt and saw somebody get healed. I felt virtue. That's only happened to me one time. But I felt it, and I said to myself, I thought, this is what Jesus was talking about. <clears throat> he said, I, who touched me? I felt virtue go out of me. Was he lying when he asked that question, who touched me? And he found her, and she said, you know, it's me, and she told the whole story. It was her faith. It's not always God's faith. And he doesn't work in one way. He'll work by somebody laying hands on you, He'll work when the crowds are roared up and the music's getting it, or he can work when things are calm and quiet. Depends on where our faith is at. Oh, I got to hurry. Mark chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 23. Did I give you that, Justin? I didn't? Okay, I go to Matthew then. Matthew chapter 12. Same story. We're running short on time anyway. Matthew chapter 12, verse 25. I give you that, didn't I? Okay said, in Jesus knowing their thoughts, he had cast out a devil. And they said, oh, he's doing this by the power of the devil. And Jesus knowing their thoughts said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself. You can live in this earth and never give God the time of day. You can be born again. I don't know how long, I don't want to draw lines there, but and, and never Never receive anything that God has for you. Just walk the natural life and die and go to heaven, I suppose. Never getting, never understanding and going after <clears throat> what belongs to me as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven and not getting in agreement with it. <clears throat> like I said, I'd go down and get prayed for it. I didn't feel anything happen, so I said, well, not this time. It didn't happen this time. No, healing always comes. It's always available for you to receive. <clears throat> so he said, he said unto them, every kingdom, we are a kingdom. The kingdom of God is inside of us. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Some people pray and they believe that Jesus, you know, they got saved, but then they start, they don't act just perfect. I've been dealt with a lot of people. And then they feel like, I'm not saved. I don't, I don't believe I'm saved. And just all kind of things. But they start saying negative. They don't believe God loves them. And it just, it gets worse and worse until you sit down and start explaining grace. You're a spirit. You have a soul and you live in a body. When they start understanding that, then they start realizing, yes, I am, Lord. God loves me. You see a smile come on their face when they start seeing it. But the kingdom of God's on the inside of you. Is there anything God cannot do? Is there anything He cannot do for you if it's within the scope of His heart, His laws, His ways? Nothing. But if we don't believe it, if the enemy tells you, you old low-down scumbucket. Why is God going to do anything for you? 
Years ago, I, after I was born again, there's times I thought, and I told Tammy one time, I said, Lord's not going to help me. I said, because I knew, I knew he told me not to get involved in something. And I got involved in something financially. And buddy, I got us in a mess. And I said, He's, I, I just don't see how the Lord's going to help me because he carried me back to the place to where he warned me. But I, I just kind of pushed that to the side. You know, I said, oh, I, I know how to do this. I've been doing this before. I know how to do this, but he warned me. And so things just wasn't working out, and I was crying out, God, why not? And he brought that. He, I, could, I can take you to the place where it happened. I know it. And I told Tammy, I said, he warned me. And I said, I got myself in this. And I said, I just don't know. I should have known better than that. But you know what? The enemy can, but if you're not careful. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ, of what he's made us, the rights that we have with the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yeah, you messed up. You knew you should have. The Lord's not going to help you. Well, I should have known better than that. We ought to know better than that. You know, that's one great hindrance to the body of Christ. I know because I've been there. Is us feeling like, am I good enough? Have I done enough? Is God pleased with me? You just need to, when you start getting those thoughts, if you're in the automobile, if you have to, just pull over, stop the car, open the door, and say, get out, Satan. Get out. And shut your mouth. You walk. You can't get back in here with me. And then go on down the road. Whatever you have to do to get that out of there. Say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I didn't earn this position. It's a gift from God. It's given to me. And when he sees me, I'm righteous. That don't mean go out here and practice sin. and You're going to open the door to the devil. Anyway, come on, Bruce. Move along. Where am I? Verse what? Which one? 22? We're in Matthew chapter 12, right? Okay, 25. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then shall this kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house, you the strong man, and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. All the enemy has to do is keep you out of the Word so you won't know who you are and what your rights are. All he has to do is keep the same old worldly negative claims coming out of your mouth and he has bound you, he's bound God. God can't override what you say in your life. He's not going to do it, even though he wants to. Tells us not to grieve the Holy Spirit, but that gets into a lot of other things too. But well, let's just move along. Um, verse thirty-one, same chapter. He said, "Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt." He's talking about us. He. He told them they were talking bad about the Holy Spirit and we're not going to get into that today. We're just talking about what we're saying out of our mouth. Our declaration is the only thing God can work with. He said either make the tree, he's talking about us, make the tree good and his fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and the fruit corrupt. What's coming out of your mouth? Is it something good? Is it bringing life or is it bringing death? I went to the doctor one time and they found some stuff, and they said, well, you'll live with this the rest of your life. I snorted so many drugs up my nose, I'd, I'd just burn it out. I got big sinuses, and they tried to cauterize a little bit in there, but anyway, they just said, hey, just wouldn't stop. They said, you just, 
You, you burn it out up there with all them drugs. You snort it up, you know. You'll live with it the rest of your life. Nose would bleed. Just bleed. All the time, just, just anything caused my nose to go to bleeding. But one day I got the Word of God in me, and it changed it. And now I don't have that problem anymore. I'm free from it. Amen? But you know what? For a while there, though, for, for a few years, I said, well, my nose would go to bleeding. I'd say, well... You know what the doctor said? Said I'd have to deal with this the rest of my life, so I guess I'll have to deal with it the rest of my life. I'd been born again 14 years and didn't know what was rightfully mine or who I was in Christ. You know, James said if a, if a man wavers, if we're in faith and then we're out of faith, he said, now James said, don't let that man think he's going to receive anything from God. Even though it's God's will, he said, a man shouldn't expect to receive anything from God. We can't say that God is in control. You can say it, but it's not true. We're in control of our own destiny. Whether we go after something or not. God's not going to force the Holy Spirit on us and the gifts to operate in us and we never go after it. No. He said more than one place, multiple places. He said basically, when you seek for me with all of your heart, that's when I'll be found of you. Amen. Verse 34, he said, O generation of vipers, how can you be in evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth's going to speak. It depends on what we're putting in and People sit and watch all kind of stuff. Some stuff's not even bad stuff. But we don't know what the Word says. We got a little bit of the Word and a whole lot of the world in there. The way we were raised, the way we were brought up, and the way other Christians act and respond around us, and we think, well, I guess I'm just like them. Maybe they don't know what's going on. Not that I'm at the top of the high rise. I hadn't, but I'm not on the bottom floor anymore. Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. Proverbs says, guard your heart above everything else. Guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. That's what you're going to be living off of is what comes out of your mouth. Verse 35 said, a good man, Jesus talking, out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man... Out of the evil treasure, you know, this goes for saved people too. If you speak in just opposite of what the kingdom of God, the word says who you are and what belongs to you, that's evil coming out of your mouth. It's working against you. An evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that this is one of some of Dwayne's favorite scriptures right in there. He said, every idle word that men speak they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment we give account for it now we sow seeds Jesus talked about in Mark chapter 4 he talked about the seed of the word of God being sown into the heart of man and it producing fruit good or bad Proverbs says life and death or death and life are in the power of the tongue Oh, I got, to, I got to close now. Mm. Verse 37 says, For by your words you shall be justified, blessed, healed, blessed, prospered, or cursed, broke, sick. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. I'm rushing. Proverbs 18 and 20 and 21 said, A man's belly, his life shall be satisfied or filled with the fruit of his mouth. And with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. You ought to go read Proverbs every day. There's 31 of them. Go read. I do. I don't do it every day, but almost. If it's 
Day 10, I read the 10th proverb. I hadn't read my proverb today, but I most likely I will before the day's over. I've been reading them for 43 years. I ought to know them by heart, but I don't. But i still been reading them. And with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Mm. So where's your faith at today? Mm. Oh, Lord Jesus. What can I do right quick? I'll tell this story again. A lot of you have heard it, and all of you may have heard it before. It's my story, and I'm going to stick to it. I'm going to keep telling it because it happened to me. It's something that happened early on. The Lord started showing me. Well, I'd heard Brother Billy, too. I didn't know a lot, but I was starting to learn. And uh, I mentioned it here a lot of times, and maybe for somebody on the TV broadcast. might be for you, too. But my daddy was in x-ray for 45 years, and uh, he thought he was good anyway. I think he thought he was a doctor. He done hung around them doctors, so he thought he was a doctor. But anyway, I kept getting a catch kind of in my lower neck, and it would go down kind of, you know how you get a crack like under your shoulder blade, but it would catch me, and it would, it would I mean, man, I'd be bowed over. I, I couldn't, I mean, it was a sharp pain. And boy, it was giving me fits. And so, you know, I'd keep on, and finally, after a while, it would start easing off. So I went over to my dad's and let him x-ray it one day. And man, when he x-rayed me, I don't know if he over-exaggerated or not, but anyway, he looked at that and he said, boy, good gracious. He said, you have, he called them cervical ribs. And he said they could cut my spinal column in two. Is that true? You think so? Is that, is that true? He said cervical. Well, he worked there at the hospital and he worked with paraplegics and all that. But he said I had a, a spinal rib growing out of my neck, not just a little knot, but it had grown out. And I guess in a way it was growing or something. And he said, man, that can paralyze you. He said, you're going to have to get that. You got to go see a doctor and they're going to have to surgically remove it. He said he'd seen it before and they had to remove it. And uh, so he was all upset about it. And you know, I'd been confessing and declaring the scriptures and finding out who I was in Christ. And, and I wasn't trying to be ugly, wasn't trying to be religious, but I just looked up at it and I said, Daddy, I don't, I, I said, that's, I don't forget exactly, but I basically said, that's not mine. That doesn't belong to me. I don't have that. And all he got, he, he didn't understand about faith. He'd been around church all his life, but he just, he got upset with me. He said, boy, you, you got to go see about this. And, uh, I mean, it was. It was getting me in a bad shape. And I just said, no, I, Daddy, I'm healed by his stripes. I said, by his stripes, I am healed. And so every time I'd go, he, he won't know. Boy, you need to go to the doctor. But every time it would catch me, I wasn't an echo. I had, I had studied and I had bought it. And that thing would catch me, man, and I'd get bowed over. And I'd say, you lying devil, take your hands off of me. I knew who I was. I said, you a liar. You don't have a right to be there. Get out of my body in Jesus' name. I'm healed. And it still would take me a while to get loose from it. And it would be sore. But every time that would happen, but then every day I was declaring what the Word said. The Lord had told me, you find me all the healing scriptures in that book and you declare them over yourself. So I did. And so, you know what? Nothing happened overnight. If, if it was up to the Lord, if my faith had been big enough, it could have went right then. But it was a good six months. We were still living in Shiloh, and I went up over the, where it used to be a railroad track there in Shiloh on King Gaps Road. As I went up over that railroad track, I heard the Holy Spirit. He said, how long has it been since you had that pain anymore? Last time you had that pain. And I thought, Man, it's been a lot. I don't remember the last time I had it. And so I was prompted. I felt like, so I called my daddy and I said, Daddy, can I come back up and you re-X-ray me? He said, sure, come on. So I went up and he re-X-rayed me. And back then they still had the dark room. You know, they had to take the film and go in there and run it through all this liquid and processor. And, and then they come out like they do and they still stick it up under them. Well, I guess they do computers now, but stick it up under them bright lights and he had the old one sticking up there. You know, you could see that thing in there. And 
he stuck the other one up there and he looked at it and he said, uh, get back up on that table. <laughs> I didn't say, I just said, okay. Got back up on the table. He went and made the, pro the next film, went in there and went through the process and put it up there. And, and he looked and he said, uh, he said, I, I don't, he said, hey, here it is right here. But he said, I can't, I can't see it. I said, you know why? Because by his stripes, I'm healed. And he still, you know, but I knew I was free. And I've been free from it from all those years. I've been free. And there's other things, but I'm out of time. But you know what? I have some problems I'm dealing with. I have cataracts on my eyes. They're not, let me back up. I don't have them. They're on my eyes. And I've been dealing with them a, long, a good while. How much time am I spending in the Word? Apparently not enough. Be it done unto you. Lord, why couldn't we cast this devil out? Did they have some faith? They tried, didn't they? He said it's because of the unbelief that's in you. But you know what? That don't mean that because it hadn't gone yet that it won't go. Or what if you have to have surgery and get them off? Then that's what I'll do. But you know what? And I don't, not knocking anybody's had cataract surgery. That's fine with me. I could probably see better right now if I had it. But uh, you know what? I, I want that testimony. I want that testimony. And you know what? I... I know Kenneth Copeland had some problems and he dealt with them for over five years. Does that mean I got to go five years? No. It's just a matter of where your faith is at. Andrew Womack had a cancer on his ear. I mean, I'm, I hate that they had that, but it's good to hear other people's testimony to know that, hey, if something didn't happen for me overnight, it doesn't mean God hadn't. He's already provided. It's, it depends on where our faith is at. Or we, can, can I manifest my healing today? I can if I have enough faith. But he dealt with a cancer on his ear. Got a doctor on his board. He said every time I'd go somewhere around people, they'd see this thing on his ear, you know. And he said, I wanted to just hide my ear. But he said, I didn't do anything about it. That's where his faith was. I've heard him say lately, I think I may have said it here. He said, I would no more get sick than I would commit adultery. Where's your faith at? And you know what? He doesn't get sick. He doesn't get sick. Brother Hagin didn't get sick. He was 87 years old for over 50 or maybe 60 years. He said, I hadn't had, as he put it, as much as an aspirin in all those years. And they was planning his funeral when he was about 16 years old. But he learned the law of Mark, the law of faith. Mark 11, 22, 23, 24, 25, and 6. And he applied it to his life. You have what you say. You're going to say what you believe. You're going to believe what you focus on and hear. Let's stand up. Thank you for your patience. Oh, I forgot to tell you. I mean, uh, Andrew said one day he went in there and looked in the mirror, and that cancer was gone. No more problem. But he went, like he said, right at six years. So how long are you willing to stand? Why did he have to deal with it that long? He said probably, for him, probably, he said probably just a lack of response, just tolerating it, just not getting after it hard enough. I say the same thing. We get busy, and we do live in a natural world. Sometimes there's things we have to do, but, you know, oh, I just want to keep telling you stories of things how the Lord's worked with me. But I'm not perfect in my faith. I deal with situations too, but you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to use my faith. I'm gonna use my faith. What happens if it don't work? We'll deal with that then. What if it does? Amen. Now, if I needed heart surgery, if I needed brain surgery, I, I don't know what, what would you do? I don't know if you have to deal with it when you get, where's your faith? Where's your faith? God will meet you at the point of your faith and he'll love you wherever you are. If you die sick and go to heaven, he's going to be there with open arms waiting to welcome you. Or you can declare faith and walk in victory. Amen? Is anybody here you need prayer this morning? The healer's in the house. I'm not the healer. I can't heal a donkey. I can't heal a flea. But he can. Amen?